So when I arrived on the Arthur weekend, um, my immediate desire was to leave. Uh, I spent most of the time avoiding anyone who looked remotely like a leader. Um, and I kept in the in the hall where it happened. There was a back door, and I just would constantly leave to go out the door to have a cigarette. Um, I didn't even smoke. I just had to have a cigarette. It was, uh, it all felt pretty strange and, and foreign and I didn't really want to be there. Yeah, that was my immediate reaction. Avoid leaders, smoke cigarettes, avoid people. My leader was very tall. He was a very nice guy. He's still a friend of mine now, but at the time I didn't really know him. And he, on the Saturday morning, approached me and said, can I pray for you? And I said, no. And he went, okay. And so that was that. I, you know, resisted him and whatever else it was that came with him. And then the next day he was, you know, you got to give him credit for perseverance because he approached me again and said, can I, in a similar kind of earnest face, <laughs> can, I, can I pray for you? And I said, okay, if it'll shut you up, I guess you can pray for me. The first word he said was, he just said, Lord, like that with his head bowed. And he clearly had been eating kippers for breakfast because I got this waft of uh, fish, yeah, which was a poor start. Um, he said, Lord, um, please bless Charlie with your Holy Spirit. And as he was praying, I sort of didn't want to shut my eyes because, you know, you want to be aware of what's going on. And so I was looking up at him and I was aware as he was praying, I could see this Adam's apple. His eyes were shut and it was, I was just staring at it, it was moving up and down. So that became my fixation. And then when I got tired of looking at that, he kept praying, I looked at the ground and I stared at this carpet and the carpet was truly ugly. Like one of those carpets where I imagined the board meeting they'd had about the carpet and the swatches and the big discussion, which is the ugliest bit of carpet we can find. And so those are my preoccupations were his Adam's apple, the carpet and the strong smell of fish. Um, and I wasn't particularly aware of any Holy Spirit or any kind of divine anything except my sort of wild thoughts and uh, defences um, and uh, and anyway after that I heard him say Amen and I just Amen Amen that's a relief um, and uh, and he smiled and uh, he has this incredible nasal sigh and he just did this long profound nasal sigh and I was relieved that he was pleased he moved on to someone else and I was left to my own thoughts and time and and I did feel genuinely a deep sense, a remarkable sense of peace. Now quite why that was, whether that was because I was relieved that nothing weird had happened, maybe it was God giving me peace, but I genuinely felt peace and I, so much so that I went and sat in the corner with my arms folded and just sort of observed the rest of the, the session um, with a large grin on my face. So that was my first experience. Essentially it was littered with odd experiences, but at the end of it, it was peace. The Holy Spirit, it's supposed to be like... Going back to my biblical learning. <laughs> God, Jesus, and the Virgin Mary, I think, should know this. <laughs> I think the Holy Spirit is whatever you find in yourself. We are our own Holy Spirits. A compass inside of you that tells you like what to do. You know, what to do and how to do kind of pulls on your your hoodie a little bit when you're about to take the wrong turn. All that encapsulates us, the aura of love, the aura of power. You know, I learned all this, but it's still such a complex thing to talk about. It's your helper, it's, it's like, your, it's your gut, it's your intuition, it's your ancestors. It's somebody speaking to you and does it make sense, but if you follow it, it makes sense. I don't see God being separate from the Holy Spirit and from Jesus. Giant spirit, kind of, but it's also not. Yeah, I guess that's confusing because when you pray, you say the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So then who's the Holy Spirit if it's not the Father and the Son? <laughs> so actually, I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> but it can also be a bird, but it also isn't. The power of God or something. It's kind of nuts to think about. Holy Spirit. I don't know, to be honest, I'm not even sure.
that technology has brought us, there's nothing quite like the natural world. It's awe-inspiring, it's breathtaking, it's life-giving. When I was growing up, I didn't hear much about the Holy Spirit. The only time the Holy Spirit was mentioned was in school assembly prayers, which always finished with the same words, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit seemed like an afterthought, at best a kind of vague supernatural force, and at worst something strange or even a bit freaky. But in the Bible, the Holy Spirit isn't a vague force, but a person that you can know. He isn't an optional extra either, he's front and central. And he wasn't a recent invention, he was there from the very beginning. And everything, all of this, was made through him. In the beginning there was God. The earth was empty, formless, dark, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. And God said, let there be light. So there was day followed by night. With each new day came new creation, vast oceans, the vaster sky, the earth green and growing. The Spirit of God, the Creator Spirit, brought out of the chaos of the cosmos, out of disorder, order, out of confusion, harmony, out of deformity, beauty. The cosmos, galaxies, the sun, the moon and every star, creatures of every shape and size to swim, fly and roam the land. Then God created man and woman in his image and breathed life into them. And God sent his spirit upon his chosen people to guide them, to give them gifts for a particular time and purpose to fulfill God's work on earth. God sent his spirit upon a man called Bezalel giving him the gift of creativity and artistic knowledge to craft and shape precious metals and gems into art, into a house for the Lord. The Spirit of God came upon Gideon, a weak and fearful man, so he became a brave warrior who saved God's people. Samson, who was taken prisoner. God sent his Spirit to give him the extraordinary strength to break free from the ropes tied around him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax, and the bindings dropped from his hands. God filled others with his Spirit for prophecy, to be his mouthpiece, bringing direction and hope to his people. The Spirit came upon Isaiah to bring good news of hope. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Upon Ezekiel, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Through the prophet Joel, we learn who this promise is for and how it will happen. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. God's promise was that he would do something new. Not just for particular people at particular times, for particular tasks, but for everyone, all people, regardless of position, age, gender, ethnicity and race. Then with the birth of Jesus, it was like a trumpet sounded, and everyone surrounding the birth of Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. Mary, the mother of Jesus, Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, John the Baptist, and then Jesus at his baptism. The Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form. Full of the Holy Spirit, he began to teach, heal the sick, bring freedom to the captives, to heal the brokenhearted. So often what happens in the Old Testament in a physical way happens in the New Testament in a spiritual way. As Bezalel was given the skill to craft and design the temple, the Holy Spirit always brings new things to our lives new attitudes, new desires, new ways of worship, new songs. Whatever you do in your workplace, the Spirit of God wants to fill you with skill, ability and creativity. Like Gideon, God uses people who feel weak, inadequate, 
ill-equipped. As God's Spirit gave Samson physical strength to break free from his bindings, so today the Holy Spirit brings freedom to break the habits, the addictions, the things that keep people spiritually bound. The Counselor, the Helper, the Gift Giver, the Guide. The Holy Spirit softens our hearts. He takes away our hearts of stone and gives us hearts of flesh. The Holy Spirit, who helps us to break free from bad habits, also harnesses a desire to love others and to help those in need, the poor, the brokenhearted, the captives. The experience of the Holy Spirit is not only about what is felt, but also about making a difference in the world. He can use you. At the age of 21, Jackie Pullinger boarded the cheapest ship she could find stopping off at the greatest number of countries and prayed to know where to disembark. She arrived in Hong Kong in 1966 when the Cultural Revolution was beginning in China and a flood of refugees was about to burst across the border into Hong Kong. More and more people crammed into a place called the Walled City, a small, densely populated, lawless area. Jackie Pullinger has spent nearly half a century living there working with prostitutes, heroin addicts and gang members. In a talk she gave to a church back in England, she started by saying, God wants us to have soft hearts and hard feet. The trouble with so many of us is that we have hard hearts and soft feet. I think a soft heart is, I don't know how to explain it really, but you probably need yours broken in order for it to become soft. Um, and that's when you begin to realize that, that the Son of God um, would have died for you if you'd been the only person. And then that the, the hard feat is to go on loving them, to go on loving them, to persevere. Through the prophet Joel, God promised that the Holy Spirit would no longer be reserved for particular people at particular times for particular purposes, but that he would be for all people. Yet this promise remained unfulfilled for many, many years. Then with the birth of Jesus, we see a marked increase in the activity of the Spirit. Everyone surrounding the birth of Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. To Mary, the mother of Jesus, an angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Then there's Mary's cousin, Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist was the first person to make the link between the Holy Spirit and Jesus. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The original meaning of the word baptize was to overwhelm, to immerse, to plunge, to drench. And that's what the Spirit wants to do. He wants to drench us, to fill us. Sometimes I feel a bit like a dry sponge. You know one of those real sponges, which when it's very dry, even when you put it in the water, initially it doesn't absorb any water because it's so hard and crusty on the outside. But then if you leave that sponge in the water, the edges begin to soften. And once the edges have softened, then the sponge can absorb so much water. The sponge is in the water, but the water is also in the sponge. And when you lift it out, the water is literally pouring out. And that's how we're meant to be, full of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus himself was completely filled with the Holy Spirit. When he was baptized by John in the River Jordan, immediately the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. In a synagogue in his hometown, Nazareth, Jesus read the words from Isaiah 61 and applied them to himself. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. On another occasion, Jesus went to a Jewish festival called the Feast of Tabernacles. 
Thousands of Jews would go to Jerusalem to celebrate the feast, to thank God for providing water in the past year, and they prayed that he would do the same again in the coming year. And there at the feast, Jesus predicted the coming of the Spirit for all people. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flowing from within. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. And Jesus being glorified meant Jesus being crucified and raised to life. He was saying that the promises of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and the others would not be fulfilled in a place, but in a person, in himself. After his death and resurrection, while eating with the disciples, Jesus said to them, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so they waited. They waited and waited. It's like a champagne bottle has been shaken and shaken. And then finally, on the day of Pentecost, the cork flies off. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Something amazing and supernatural was happening and people didn't know how to explain it, so they gave natural explanations like they've had too much wine, they're drunk. And then Peter got up and said, let me explain to you what's happening. These people are not drunk. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. This is the Holy Spirit. This was prophesied in the Old Testament and Peter quotes the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. And then he says something even more amazing. He says, this is for you. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. The promise of the Father, this promise of life, of harmony, of beauty for ashes, of creativity, of newness, of strength, of freedom, compassion, anointing, of living water, the gift of the Holy Spirit, who once came upon particular people at particular times for particular purposes, is now for you. Pope John Paul II said, the Spirit is always awesome whenever he intervenes. He arouses astonishing new events. He radically changes people and history. When I was a teenager, I remember going on a Christian week away with my best friend, Dave. And we arrived there, and everyone was divided into two groups based on age. And we obviously really wanted to be in the older group. It was so much cooler. They'd sit around on the grass talking about God and dating and girls. Whereas we sat on the inside, colouring pictures of Old Testament characters. It was so boring. Anyway, on the last evening, I couldn't find Dave anywhere. And then I found out that he'd sneaked into the older group and they'd been praying for each other to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as they finished their session, I could see them all come outside laughing and singing and hugging, and something amazing and positive had clearly happened. But I was so annoyed, I was so upset that I'd missed out. And to add insult to injury, the girl that I liked had just refused to hold my hand. And eventually one of these students happened to wander over to me. And he asked me how I was, and being British, I obviously had said, I'm fine, thanks. And he said, but can I pray for you? And I said, yeah, all right then. And I remember he prayed this really simple prayer. He said, thank you, Lord, that you love Toby. Please fill him with your Holy Spirit, with your joy and your peace. And almost immediately, I began to feel this overwhelming sense of love filling my body, God's love. And the more that we waited, the more this feeling of love and joy grew, so much so that this smile broke out on my face and then I started laughing. And I can't describe it any other way than this. I just knew for the first time that God loved me. And I was so happy, so happy that I got up and I jumped into the swimming pool fully clothed. 
I was born in Hungary in the 1980s, and this was at the time when the country was still under the communist regime. And what this meant in terms of faith is that it was not discussed, not at the workplace, not in schools, not at home. And I grew up with the notion that religious people were disillusioned, uneducated, or just not very intelligent. In my 20s, I moved to England. One Sunday, a friend of mine invited me out for coffee. And it was really nice, but at the end of it, she said, um, I'm going to church now, do you want to come with me? And I really didn't feel like it. But then I thought, well, I have nothing else to do. I'll go along, and if it's too weird, I'll just leave. And to my biggest surprise, the speaker that night didn't seem disillusioned or uneducated. And actually, some of what he said made a lot of sense. So that confused me. But at the, at the end of the service, they said, if you have questions about any of this, try Alpha. So that's what I did. I went along to Alpha and I listened to all the talks and um, I discussed them with my small group. And I must say I was the most cynical person in the group and I probably had most of the questions. And I think I was quite aggressive in my approach. But what really got to me is that they have loads of patience and love and they really took time to answer all my questions. I went back to church, but that night was different because it felt like as if everything was for me. The sermon, the prayers, even the songs. And at the end of the service, the pastor said, I feel like there is somebody here who feels broken. And I instantly knew it was for me because I had been feeling broken for a very long time. But there was no way I was going to go up to the front. <laughs> then he said, or you could echo this prayer in your heart. And then I, th and I thought, okay, why not? So I closed my eyes and I said, Jesus, if you are real, come into my life. And at that moment, the worship band started playing a song that kept repeating the line, there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. This huge wave of emotion came over me and there was a huge warmness around my heart, like when a heart is being mended. And I never cry in public, but I couldn't stop sobbing. And I guess I didn't even have the time to feel embarrassed about it. A friend of mine came over to pray for me. And I didn't know it then, but I know now that what happened is that I got filled with the Holy Spirit. Everyone's experience is different, but this is the amazing promise of the Father. The gift of the Holy Spirit is no longer just for particular people at particular times, for particular purposes. It's for everyone.